All right, happy Friday. Uh, we are going to continue to work our way through the heart. Uh, and we left off on Wednesday with the coverings around the heart, the fibrous tissue that uh, encases the heart. And you'll remember that we had an exterior casing uh, that we referred to uh, as the parietal pericardium. And then we had an internal casing that was associated with the tissue of the heart, which we refer to as the visceral pericardium or the epicardium. And then there's a space in between. And this space between the pericardial layers is known as the pericardial cavity. And we want to leave this pericardial cavity as a potential space. And hopefully you'll remember a potential space as a uh, part of human physiology that can become a space under either pathophysiological conditions or it becomes a space um, like during pregnancy with the uterus. So uh, a, a deviant uh, form of physiology. This pericardial cavity is going to be filled with pericardial fluid. It's going to be filled with pericardial fluid. This pericardial fluid is going to be actually produced by the visceral tissue. So produced by the visceral tissue or the visceral pericardium. And what happens with the pericardial fluid is it begins to fill up that cavity and it acts as a lubricant. So it provides lubrication. And this lubrication is very, very important. Just like the motor oil in the engine of your car, this is going to prevent low or uh, wear and tear because of a low friction environment. So we allow a low friction environment. Now if this low friction environment of the pericardial cavity, if we fill it up with fluid or if we fill it up with uh, additional uh, air or something like that, beating of the heart becomes very painful. Uh, and that painful heartbeat uh, is excruciating enough that it requires severe med medical attention or serious medical attention. And usually what they do is they stab a large gauge needle through one of the ribs, hit that pericardium, and release that air, that extra fluid, and it deflates the pericardial uh, space, and that cavity goes back to its normal physiological condition, and heartbeat instantly becomes comfortable and tolerable. So we need it to be a very low friction environment. And we gave that example of rubbing your hands together. It's not going to take very long before that becomes painful if you do it long enough. Now, in addition to fluid in the pericardial space, we also can induce inflammation. And when we have inflammation of the pericardium, we call this pericarditis. And pericarditis is also going to induce rough movement. So rough movement. And again, here too, each beat is a very painful experience. So the pericardium is very important, and it's going to really be beneficial in making the beat of the heart 2.8 to 3 billion times in a lifetime comfortable and efficient. All right, so just below the visceral pericardium modeled here in blue, you have this very thick red tissue. And this is going to make up what we call the heart wall. You've got a slightly different view here of the heart wall. You'll still see our pericardium, our pericardial space. 
uh, and then the visceral or serous, per serous pericardium, and then we have all of this tissue. Now, what kind of cells do you think we're going to have in here? Mm, definitely not epithelium. I know you just wanted to say squamous. <laughs> Cardiomyocytes, so this is going to be cardiac muscle tissue. This is actually what's going to induce contraction of the heart. The cells are cardiac muscle cells or cardiomyocytes. On the very external layer, again, this is going to be epicardium. So this will be our fibrous tissue that makes up our visceral pericardium. Just below that, the thickest portion is going to be made up of myocardium. And it will be the makeup of the myocardial tissue, primarily of cardiomyocytes. And so this is a layer of cardiac muscle. And as you can see in this figure very clearly, this is going to be the thickest layer of tissue within the heart wall. Now, in all reality, we're going to get to this eventually, but we know that there are four chambers in the heart, two atria and two ventricles. And the width or the thickness of the myocardium changes depending on what, uh, what chamber we're actually associated with. Atria only need to push the blood into the ventricles. That's a very short distance. The uh, right ventricle pushes blood into the pulmonary circuit, which is a minimal circuit compared to the general circulation. The left ventricle distributes blood throughout the whole general circulation. So we need a much thicker heart wall uh, around the left ventricle to accomplish that task. Much thicker muscle to induce those changes in pressure so that we can pump blood everywhere. So this very thick myocardium, I'm not even coming close to spelling that right. I'm trying to spell fluctuates. There you go. So it's going to fluctuate. The size of that tissue or the width of that tissue is going to fluctuate depending on the chamber that we are observing. And again, left ventricle will have the thickest chamber. Now, why does it have the thickest chamber? It's distributing blood over to the general circulation, which is a large circuit. But it's not just because of the large area that we need to distribute blood through. It's actually more related to the amount of pressure that's required to move blood through that whole circuit. So we're going to have the thickest myocardium associated with the higher or highest pressure chambers. So high pressure chambers, the chambers that induce the highest pressure, are going to have the thickest myocardium. And it reasons from there that low pressure will be thinner or lower thickness. Now the organization globally within the heart of the myocardium, it structures the heart tissue in a very unique way. Uh, we call it the myocardial, myocardial vortex. It sounds like a great title for a movie or a book. So what exactly is the myocardial vortex? The myocardial vortex is, is actually the organization of the tissue so that when the heart goes through its contraction sequence, it actually is like wringing out a wet 
wash clot. So the myocardial vortex is, the heart's just not contracting, sort of beating, it's actually sort of ringing or rotating, twisting every time it beats. So we have this twisting tissue that's due to the cellular orientation. Twisting tissue that's due to cellular orientation. And this twisting motion, again, results in a heart contraction that is or exhibits a ringing motion. Now you can actually experiment with the effects of why this is so important or why this is so advantageous for the heart to actually do. Go home tonight, take a washcloth and fill it up with water and then just try to squeeze it and squeeze as much of that water out as you can. And then take that same washcloth and twist it and you'll get more water out. So we can actually induce more pressure on these mechanical tissues by rotating them, putting that ringing or twisting motion in to help increase the amount of pressure that we can induce during myocardial contraction. So pericardium, and then we have the myocardium, and then the very inside of all of our chambers, or each of our four chambers, is going to be covered up with a tissue called endocardium. So endocardium lines the interior of the heart. And it's going to cover not only the walls of the chambers, but also covers the valves and even extends out of the heart into the blood vessels. Okay, so the endocardium is this inner layer that surrounds all of the inside of the heart. Did you know the heart has a skeleton? Uh, this picture is a really good representation of the orientation of cells that allow the myocardial vortex to exist. Uh, and it also shows the heart's skeleton. And it's a fibrous skeleton. It's not calcified bones, but it's still... Uh, a skeleton nonetheless, it's just it's fibrous tissue rather than hardened bone tissue. Now, this particular skeleton is going to be made up and, and consist of collagen. So we talked about collagen before, it's a protein that gets built up into a thread. So we're going to use this thread-like protein to make this fibrous, collagenous network. And it is actually going to be affixed uh, around the valves to support the valves and other heart tissue. So it is going to be affixed between the upper and lower portions of the heart, surrounding the valves as a fibrous ring.
surrounds the valves in the middle of the heart between the upper and lower portions and, and supports the, the valves as a fibrous ring. Now, what is exactly the purpose of a heart skeleton? Well, one of the main purposes is to provide structure. So it's a structural support. My spelling is, uh, let's just say I would not win the spelling bee today. There we go. Structural support. So it anchors cells and allows those cells something to pull on. You know, we, the, the skeleton, the, the bone skeleton that we have, the muscles attached to it, and it gives those muscles anchor so they can pull. This is the same concept here. This is why we're calling it a skeleton. It provides that structural support, helps to anchor those cells that make up the myocardium. And when they contract, it allows their effective pulling. But that's not the only reason. Uh, that's a really good reason. It helps the heart to really be able to contract well. But it is also the, the and you're familiar with this now, you know that there's, an, there's a cardiac conduction system in the heart that begins with the sinoatrial node, goes to the atrial ventricular node, and then passes from that upper portion of the heart to the lower portion of the heart. And we want the upper portion, the upper conduction, to be separate from the lower conduction so that we induce atrial contraction followed by ventricular contraction rather than occurring at the same time. And so we're actually going to have electrical insulation so that we prevent the electrical activity occurring in the upper portion of the heart from escaping into the lower portion of the heart to allow both ventricles and atria to contract at the same time. So the skeleton is going to act as an electrical insulator. Since everybody has this, I'm going to make an adjustment here on the screen. We good? Now there's one other potential. We don't really know for sure if this is true or not. It appears that it probably is true. So I'm going to put it as may. This heart skeleton may aid in chamber refilling after a beat as well. And so there's maybe some mechanical support as the heart refills and responds to uh, uh, the, the, beat, the, the beating process after a beat has occurred, it could be that the skeleton provides enough support that we have more effective atrial filling. Okay, so let's take a look at the inside of the heart, take a cross-section through the heart here, and start to work our way through the anatomy that we find here. The most prominent feature uh, internal to the heart are going to be our heart chambers. And we have two different types of chambers and two different locations. The superior chambers are going to be called atria. Singular is going to be atrium. And they are going to be designated as a left and a right. So superior chambers, we left atria, atrium, and right atrium, or the left and right atria. The atrium are going to receive blood, specifically from the circulatory surface. So we'll receive blood from the circulatory circuits. 
So in this picture, right atria is on this side, left atria is on this side, or left atrium, right atrium, left atrium. The right atrium is going to suck blood from the general circulation from the superior and inferior vena cava. Those are the large vessels that lead into the right atrium. The left atrium is going to accept blood back from the pulmonary circuit. Uh, and it's going to come back in from the uh, left and right pulmonary veins. So they'll receive blood from our pulmonary and from our general circuits, and then they're going to push blood into the ventricles. Now that's a very short distance. We're talking about a matter of inches. So as we've already mentioned, we're going to have thinner walls. Myocardium is going to be thinner here because of the lighter workload. So we're just pumping blood into our ventricles. Um, it's not very well uh, illustrated here. They, they've, they've labeled it and they show it here. But if we were to remove uh, our pulmonary artery there, the trunk, pulmonary trunk coming out of the right ventricle, you would see this a little bit better. So sort of hidden behind the pulmonary artery in the pulmonary trunk, there is a layer of myocardial tissue, and it's called a septum. Anytime we divide uh, the left side and the right side of the heart, whether it's atria or ventricles, that's a septum. And so we're going to have uh, the interatrial septum that separates these two chambers. So our interatrial septum. And during embryogenesis and embryo and fetal embryo and fetal development, we actually have a hole that is found through the interatrial septum. And this actually allows blood flow or prevents blood flow from going through the pulmonary circuit of the embryo goes into left atria, gets distributed into the left ventricle and pumped out into the general circuit. We're not oxygenating any blood during embryogenesis. That is happening through the, mater uh, the maternal pulmonary circuit uh, by way of the uh, umbilical cord and the placenta. So we actually divert blood through. We, we prevent it from going into the right uh, uh, ventricle and pumped out into the pulmonary circuit. It goes through. Um, Right atria, right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle to the to the to the general circuit. That actually appears as a fossa uh, on the surface of the in, uh, inter uh, interatrial septum, and we actually can observe that in uh, in in adult. It basically seals up, closes up, and prevents that circuit um, from continuing. Uh, shortly before birth, it's going to seal up, and we're going to begin to circulate blood through the through the lungs, so the baby will begin to oxygenate their own uh, their own bloodstream. Is that ever not closed up? It does. Sometimes it doesn't close up, and they have to go in and do fetal infant uh, infant surgery to close it up. So, like, I was born really premature, and I have a little more heart. So, like, how does it? It's actually an endocrine response, and it's associated with prostaglandins. If you have prostaglandin release, you actually will begin to seal that up naturally. Um, and there are actually some painkillers that they used to give that prevented prostaglandin secretion, uh, and it was a it was a problem um, with, with sealing that that hole up. Um, so they may not have to do surgery. They may actually be able just to provide that myelin with hormones and, and get the natural process to occur, but sometimes it becomes emergent and um, requires to be a little bit more invasive. Now, this is not to say that the heart 
doesn't necessarily begin to distribute blood through the pulmonary circuit. It actually may distribute blood through the pulmonary circuit as well. Some of it gets squirted down into the right ventricle and some of it gets squirted over into the, into the atrium. And it just depends on how, um, it just depends on how serious it was. Did I do something wrong? Yeah, it's not squirting. Squirting? <laughs> yeah. So that's what they mean by holder. Like if you have a hole in your heart, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, or it could be a gunshot wound, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> um, we have some muscular ridges on the external surface. Of both atria. <laughs> that are going to help with um, contraction of the muscle. These are called the pectinate muscles. So that's our superior chambers. How about our inferior chambers? Inferior chambers are called the ventricles. And these two will have left and right designators. And they will pump blood into the circulatory circuit. Now, because we're going over to a much larger distribution circuit rather than just atria into the ventricles, we're going to begin to see thick walls. So we have thick mitocardial tissue, and this is associated with the heavier workflow, or workload, I should say, of pumping blood into the circuits. And in this picture here, you actually can see pretty nicely, you know, this is far thicker here than in the atria, but not nearly as thick as on the left ventricle side. Um, so the uh, right ventricle, a smaller circuit, smaller pressures, so smaller tissue. The left ventricle, much thicker tissue because of how much further the blood has to be distributed, which requires much higher production pressures. So the left ventricle is going to be the thickest wall. Uh, here, too, our ventricles are going to be separated by interventricular interventricular septum which you can see here, and because you've already studied the anatomy of the conduction system, you know houses the bundle of hiss in the left and right bundle branches before they um, turn into the Purkinje fibers. Now on the external surface of the ventricles, we also have muscular ridges. will help out with the pumping process. These muscular ridges are well defined and they are known as trabeculae carnae. All right, we already know that uh, we have the myocardial skeleton. And housed in that myocardial skeleton are the valves. The valves are going to exist between the atria and the ventricles, 
and then between the ventricles in there, you need circuits. So the heart valves are going to be situated at openings. Situated at openings, and we're going to find valves between the atria and the ventricle. That's supposed to be a B. At the exit to arteries. Now, in the case of the right ventricle, that artery is going to be the pulmonary trunk. In the case of the left ventricle, that artery is going to be the aorta. Now, note that there are going to be no valves at the veins. that bring blood into the atria. So we don't have veins for the inferior and superior vena cavas, and we don't have uh, uh, valves, I should say, I think I said veins, I meant valves for the inferior and superior vena cava, and we don't have valves coming in from the left and right pulmonary veins. Now, when we look at the valves, the valves contain these uh, anatomical features that are called cusps or leaflets. And basically, these are the flaps that help to create the opening and closing portion of the valve. And we are going to find that they consist of uh, all, there are four different valves that we're going to identify. And they're going to consist of between two and three of these cusps or leaflets. Okay, so we'll be looking for these cusps or these leaflets as we go through each of these valves. Now there are four different valves, but there are really two types of valves. Okay, so there are four different types of valves. Each of the four have two or three cusps or leaflets. And there are going to be two types of these four valves. So we're going to have two atrial ventricular valves, and we're going to have two semilunar valves. And we're going to start out with the atrial ventricular valves, or sometimes referred to as the AV valves. So just like their name alludes to, these are going to be between the atria and the ventricles. The right side of the heart, the AV valve that is there, is going to be called the tricuspid valve. Named because it has three of those cusps or leaflets. On the left side, we are going to have the bicuspid valves, or also sometimes referred to as the mitral valve. Now, in order to remember these, one of the tricks I'm going to give you as you're thinking about this, it doesn't work so well for me anymore because I'm 35, but it will work well for you because you are close to being 23 years old. And so if you hold up your fingers, so that you can read 23, so let me kind of do it backwards here, 23, you know exactly which cusps are on which side. So on this side, there are three cusps. On this side, there are two cusps. So tricuspid is on the right, bicuspid or mitral is on the left. So hold it up so you can read 23. Thank you. 
23. So you can look at it and you can read 23, not 32. 23. Yeah, let's make it even more complicated. We'll cross them, we'll come up between the leg. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You're nursing your cardiac nursing gang sign. What's that? Sounds so old. Okay, how old are you now? Nineteen. Nineteen. That's four years. I'm 35, I'm so far away from 23 <laughs> that I wish I was 23 because that was when I just had gotten a job and didn't have all the responsibilities that I have. So it's a lot better than being 35 and not that much different than being 19. Plus it's not really, whatever. <laughs> it's really all about you learning where these valves are in your heart. And I would recommend that when you become a cardiac nurse someday, that you don't go in or... <laughs> Alright, so our tricuspid valve and our bicuspid valve, when they open up, they are going to open up into the ventricle. And you can see that here in this figure, that the leaflets actually descend or permeate into the ventricle. And so the blood is just simply going to begin to flow out of the atria down along the leaflets into the ventricle. Now how do they actually open up? What forces or what's the stimuli to open these guys up? Actually, you know what, let me, um, everybody have this? Take the moment to adjust. So the leaflets open up into the ventricle. What's actually opening them? Well, the atria is going to contract. And now remember, we need to think a little bit about fluid dynamics and the pressure of physics, or the physics of pressure. There we go. When I decrease volume, I'm always going to increase pressure. So as the atria begins to contract, I reduce the volume of the atria. The amount of blood that remains in there is going to be the same, but it's going to have more and more pressure pushing on it until it gets to a point where it can actually overcome the pressure in the ventricle and the valve will pop open. So atrial pressure is actually going to be what is responsible to push the valve open and allow blood through. And as long as the pressure in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricle, the valve will be maintained open and allow blood to flow. Now, eventually that ventricle is going to start to contract too. And as the ventricle begins to contract, we're going to begin to reduce ventricular volume. The volume of blood or the amount of blood is going to begin to be pushed on, increasing its pressure, and eventually we're going to get to a point where we have more pressure in the ventricle than in the atria, and that valve is going to actually snap back closed. Okay? So it will be the ventricle or the atrial pressure that opens the valve to allow blood to begin to flow in, and then ventricular pressure. closes the valve. Now, there is a condition in which the valve would open backwards. And so the leaflets, other than just shutting, would open all the way back up and blood would begin to squirt back into the atria. And you should recognize that as being a very inefficient way to circulate blood. That condition is known as prolapse and it does occasionally occur. So this is an unusual closing uh, of the valve into the artery, back into the artery. 
But this is actually normally prevented. So prolapse is going to be prevented. And when the valve snaps back, it's going to snap back to its original closed position and blood's not going to squirt back or leak back into the atrium. It's prevented by these tiny little muscles and the associated little tendons that are going to station a, a, a prevent over uh, closure of the atrial, vent atrial ventricular valves. Atrial ventricular valves. Those are called, so prolapse is prevented by chordae tendinae. So chordae tendinae, which Latin for tendinous cords. They are going to be affixed to small little muscles that as the ventricle contracts, those little muscles contract and pull on chordae tendinae, which in return pull on the individual leaflets of the valve. And so as the ventricle contracts, it's going to pressure, the pressures being induced are going to flap those valves shut but chordae tendinae and these little muscles called papillary muscles are going to prevent the valve from flapping all the way back. And that's what you can see here. This is the muscle right here, and then this is chordae tendinae, and these are the leaflets of the muscles there. I'm going to abbreviate chordae tendinae as CT. So the chordae tendinae are anchored to the papillary muscles. that are fixed in the floor of the ventricle. These are extensions of the myocardium, and they will also contract as the ventricle is induced to contract. So the pressure is what opens up the thing, and the tendon is cord was there to stop it from going to prolapse. From, from stopping it from prolapse. So they just don't, they don't like open it. Yeah, they don't open it. They just prevent the, the Overclosure. The other thing that's really interesting, and we're going to talk about this in a little more detail, as blood pours out of the atria into the ventricles, those leaflets actually begin to float up on the blood. And then the ventricle begins to contract, and that uh, leaflet that's floating on the blood is going to be induced to snap back to its original position, held from going through prolapse by chordae tendinae and muscles. Okay, so that's our atrial ventricular valves, our AV valves. The second type of valve are the semilunar valves. And the semilunar valves, uh, you can see um, the pulmonary semilunar valve in very good detail here in this figure. Uh, the semilunar valves. are going to be between the ventricles and our circulatory circuits. So we'll have a pulmonary semilunar valve that is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary circulation, and we're going to have a pulmonary, or I'm sorry, a semilunar valve, the aortic semilunar valve between the left ventricle and the general circulation out to the aorta. So it's proper to call them semilunar valves, or you can simply refer to them as the pulmonary valve, or pulmonary semilunar valve, and the aortic valve, or aortic semilumen, semilumen, semilunar, <laughs> semilunar valve. Wow. So why semilunar? There are going to be three cusps in each of these valves. In these three cusps or leaflets, they actually have a moon shape. And so they look somewhat like the moon, so they are semi-lunar. Now, these valves allow pressure in one direction.
or really what they have to do is they just have to withstand pressures in one direction. So we know already that the ventricles are very high pressure inducing chambers. They generate a lot of pressure as they squeeze the blood uh, out of the heart into their respective circuits. The arteries that the blood is being pumped into, there is very little, no or appreciable, no appreciable pressure. So we have a system where we have very high levels of pressure in the ventricles, low amounts of pressure out in the arteries, in the uh, pulmonary artery, in the pulmonary trunk, and in the aorta. Now, because of this, there's actually very little prolapse throughout. Appreciable? So very little prolapse threat. And so because of that, we don't find any chordate tendon or papillary muscles. So really, we have no need to um, prevent the valve from, it would prolapse into the ventricle. Normally, it opens up to allow blood out, opens into the artery, and that's its normal flow. But because there's no pressure from the artery, we're not going to push blood back in towards the ventricle. The pressure in the ventricle is actually always going to be either equal to or higher than the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. I got three minutes left. In the next three minutes, we're going to take a look at blood flow through the heart. Did everybody get that, or was that too quick? Yeah. Okay, so let's take it blood and look at blood flow through the heart. Now, there's no real place to start. We could basically start just about anywhere, but for all uh, practical purposes and by convention, we normally start with what's happening here in the right atrium. Really, in your mind, what you have to think is that this is a two-sided pump. And so we can track, we could jump on a red blood cell, do the magic school bus thing, and ride a, uh, a red blood cell through the heart. But what's happening over here, there's stuff happening over here at the same time on the left side. So we will start with convention, and we're going to start with the blood incoming from the systemic circuit. So as blood comes in from your systemic circuit or from your general circulation, it's going to enter into the right atrium through the inferior and the superior vena cava. Inferior vena cava is going to bring all the blood up from the lower portions of the body. It's basically draining blood from the toes up to the heart. And then the superior vena cava is draining blood through, from the arms and the head and, and neck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Blood basically is always flowing. And so it's going to flow in from the top and in from the bottom uh, of the heart. So blood will begin to enter the right atrium. And as blood enters the right atrium, 
the valve is going to be closed. And so we're beginning to fill the right atrium up with blood. Okay? And as it begins to fill up with blood, it's going to, we're going to induce contraction through the electrical conduction system, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And this is going to begin to reduce the volume of the atrium. Blood volume remains the same, or the amount of blood remains the same, but the atria begins to collapse down. And whenever, again, whenever we do this, can't express this enough, whenever we reduce the volume of a container, like the atria, we increase the pressure experienced by that container. You could do the same thing with um, a beaker and seal it off and put a piston in there, and you can push on that piston which is going to reduce the volume, but it'll increase the pressure. We can try to measure that pressure and it would increase the increased pressure. So as blood enters the right atrium, we're filling it up and then it's going to begin to contract, or the atrium is going to begin to contract and it's going to increase pressure and eventually the blood's going to be pushed through the AV valve. And as it goes through the AV valve, which since we're starting in the right heart, uh, right side of the heart, what, what AV valve is this? So this is going to be the tricuspid valve. Gosh, I give you a trick and then you don't even use it. So it pushes through the AV valve. And the cliffhanger for the week is going to be that eventually the AV valve is going to open up.